Now is the time on sprockets when we dance and learn to throw. It's actually not bad. Um, we're working out some, I think I see a reboot here. What operating system are you running, sir? Uh, he said, yeah, but the follow-on words weren't really believable. <laughs> still booting? No, it's not oh. still booting. It's, it's trying to cram a bunch of bits into its fucking memory. <laughs> <laughs> it's just HTML, man. I mean, shit, I could get it off of here now. Well, can you just launch VI? And, like, just, <laughs> <laughs> just read it? Or does Emacs interpret HTML natively? I just, I'm sorry. It does. Well, yes, it does. Well, it reads your mail. It will display web pages. There we go. Fuck your man. mom. Sorry. Oh. Damn. I bet there's a... <laughs> I bet maybe. I bet there's a list box. Command X, <laughs> Command M, O, M. Okay, so I'm, I'm, you can do your thing. I can do my thing. So you're, you're ready. I can do an intro and okay. Um... So this is uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph Lorenzo Hall. He's going to give our keynote tonight. I'm always um, very grateful that Shmukan uh, keynote uh, uh, invita invitees accept because we're an odd group of people. Uh, we also ask you to come on a Friday night as a last talk to come in and give a keynote, which doesn't really feel like the keynote spot. You look at RSA and their 15 keynotes, and they're all kind of during the day when people are awake and sober. Here we're like, no, you've been drinking a bit. Come watch this guy talk. So Joseph's here. We're super happy to have him. Um, and I think it's actually very timely to have him because there's an awful lot of attention on cybersecurity in this town now. Right? There was a little bit of attention like at the Pentagon and some other forts and places like that over the years, but now the Congress critters are paying attention and the regulators are paying attention. And it's great because we need help and it's terrifying because, I, I mean, <laughs> because people like Ted Cruz are now the head of the science board for the House, right? Like, you know, so sorry if I offended anyone with that, but, um, you know, but, legislation and regulation are not necessarily made correctly. And oftentimes it's in hindsight that we realize, well, that sucked, that should never have been, it caused us problems. And sometimes we realize that, sometimes the Congress critters realize that, the, re the regulators realize that. Joseph's role and, and why we're happy to have him here is to try to make sense of all that and bring together the technology and the policy and the important social issues and try to help make uh, Washington a little more sane when it comes to cybersecurity, which I think we can all agree is uh, um, seriously needed. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, sir, you, and sir. Uh, good luck. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. So my name is Joe. I'm from CDT. I'm a, the chief technologist. Uh, this is my first keynote ever. It's my first ShmooCon ever. And so um, I, I have a, I've always wanted to come to ShmooCon. I've never had a really good excuse. I used to be an academic and felt like I needed an excuse to go things. I guess I don't need a fucking excuse anymore. So if, if anything, the, uh, hopefully you'll get something interesting out of this. Um, so uh, before I do anything, if you get any one thing out of my talk, and here's where I'm going to need audio, and I'm doing my volume up and down, which should go, but it's not, so I'm assuming there's probably no audio here. Okay. So if you get one thing out of my talk, it's, it's, it's this, and so I'll, I'll just shut up. Uh. The gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, is ready. Thank you, Chairman. And, uh, I so this is uh, Representative uh, Jason Chaffetz from Utah. Just to I have the greatest uh, respect for you and for the Ranking Member Conyers. I, I do appreciate uh, the manager's amendment. I do think it is moving. Uh, it is certainly better. Uh, there is clearly a problem. I, 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 I understand that there is a problem. But I worry that this is the wrong remedy. Uh, I was trying to think of a way to try to describe my concerns with this bill, but basically we're going to create, we're going to do surgery on the internet and we haven't had a doctor in the room tell us how we're going to change these organs. We're basically going to reconfigure the internet and how it's going to work without bringing in the nerds, without bringing in the doctors. And again, I worry that we did not take the time to have a hearing to truly understand what it is we're doing. And to my colleagues, I would say, if you don't know what DNSSEC is, you don't know what you're doing. 
And so my concern is that there is a problem, but this is not necessarily the right remedy. Now, I've, when we have, uh, for instance, Sandia National Labs say that, quote, would negatively impact U.S. and global cybersecurity and Internet functionality, I would hope that we get everybody paused to say, maybe we ought to ask some nerds what this thing really does. That's basically the gist of my entire talk. It's just like, <laughs> anyway, so to give you a, a real basic outline here, nerds, for, right, for real. And the funny thing is, like, nerd, hacker, whatever, none of those words really describe the, the, the body of work in this room. And so, you know, all those things are epithets to what you guys do and what I see you guys doing. Um, but just real quick, some background. I'm going to talk about who I am, because many of you probably don't know me. I know some of you, and I've worked with some of you for a very, very long time, and, and I love a lot of you. Um, you may not even know what CDT is, where I work. Some of you may. Um, and you, and I, I'd like to describe a little bit about what we do. Um, I'm going to go through a couple of uh, uh, war stories, you know, instances in which technical expertise has been critical into making sure bad stuff doesn't happen. Um, and then spend the bulk of the time on sort of coming battles that we have uh, lined up for this year, and, and definitely including the sort of really troubling CFAA stuff we've heard about this, this week, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, this stuff that will make, you know, hacking and doing security research a whole lot easier if it sort of sails through. Um, so some quick background. Who am I? Uh, I, I actually have a background in hard sciences, uh, in, in astrophysics. I, pro, I, I uh, modeled planetary atmospheres in Fortran 77 for a really long time. Um, which is a pain in the ass, no dynamic allocation of memory, anything like that. My first uh, publication was in science, which is kind of cool. Uh, we discovered clouds in a moon of uh, Saturn called Titan. Um, I, I actually, in the middle of my grad school career, I went to this talk by my future PhD advisor, Pam Samuelson at Berkeley. That said, and the whole talk was about how the DMCA is inhibiting cryptography research. And I was like, Man, I read about that stuff on Slashdot. I don't even know if Slashdot's a thing anymore, but man, I used to read it all the time on, on my lunch, right? And, and I was like, wow, people get paid to do this stuff that I sit there and read about on, on my lunch. Um, and I realized that what I really wanted to do in my life was to help people. And I don't know if that resonates with, with any of you. It may. Uh, great. Um, and how, how the hell can I do that? So I changed what I was going to do, and I ended up getting a PhD from UC Berkeley School of Information. Uh, Two lawyers on my committee, David Wagner, who some of you might know, just such an amazing man, um, and then Coy Cheshire, a social psychologist, also an amazing man, whatever, uh, and, and Pam and Deirdre are just awesome people. Um, for my PhD, I, I like to tell people casually that I hacked voting machines, but man, that, in this crowd, that, that is not true by any means. If you, if you read my thesis, it's all about basically policy hacking. It's ways to sort of... Uh, uncover what the black box does. And so it goes into, you know, is open source the answer? Well, no, it's rarely the freaking answer to, like, learning how things work. I mean, it helps, but it's, it's not going to, it's not going to make sure that something does what it says it does. Um, stuff like that, contractual arrangements, and then something I think that is as important to voting as the secret ballot has been, this notion of risk-limiting audits or, or statistical recounts, which I think is really going to change elections for all of humanity and anyone else, that any aliens that happen to be listening into the research we do. Um, I do a lot of work in a bunch of areas. Some of them are listed up here, consumer privacy, health tech. I still do some e-voting. I still do some space policy occasionally, which is kind of weird. You want to talk about something that, that just doesn't move a whole lot. <laughs> that, that's one of them. Although, man, with the manned space stuff, maybe not. You can kind of think of me as half a lawyer and half a computer scientist. I know enough about both to sort of be competent in them. If I walk in a room of computer scientists, they think I'm a lawyer. If I walk into a room of lawyers, they think I'm a computer scientist. So maybe there's something wrong about that, <laughs> but who knows? You know, I, I, I can talk about formal verification. I can talk about, you know, in rem jurisdiction, crap like that. Um, whatever. Um, so CDT, what is CDT? Um, we're part of a, a sort of a, a genre of digital rights organizations. We focus on research and advocacy. Our two strengths involve convening folks, so bringing people together to, you know, come up with things, you know, ways to make the world a better place or to make the world not as bad as some people want to make it. Um, and expertise. We have a lot of in-house expertise in, in, in the things that, that we work on. Um, we have sort of a, a curious 
uh, way that we're supported, we get a big chunk of our money from grants from foundations. We get a big chunk of our money from companies. And so some people will consider us a trade organization and that's, you're welcome to think that. Um, but we don't take money to say anything on anyone's behalf. We'll take your money if you like what we say and by all means you're welcome to support us. But please, there's plenty of people working in this, in this area, EFF, ACLU, Axis, folks like that. Um, we really, the thing that, that sort of drives us are these principles I've listed up here. We really think that the internet and digital technology empowers people. You know, these things can help change the world. Um, we always are trying to find collaborative solutions. You know, if you can show up, like for example, we have this coalition that includes the Heritage Foundation, Americans for Tax Reform, ACLU, and CDT. If you can show up in a Congress Critter's office with that kind of a coalition, they will listen, no matter who you are, what you, I mean, that, that's it right there. Um, and some of what we do is never public. We kind of play the inside game. We, we often will meet privately with folks and, and work things out and, and try and say, look, this is the way it goes. Um, we often, a big part of what we do, and people that are academics who work with us know this, we try and make, like if you get asked to testify, we try and make sure that it's as easy for you to come to DC and just say the things that you work on and, and, and the things you believe without having to deal with any other crap. And maybe you'll come back and, and, and like Representative Chaffetz actually said, um, you know, help, you know, be one of the nerds they bring in. Um, so, so some people may have a, a sort of a, 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 you may not really understand, you know, what is tech policy? Is it, it's not this really mysterious thing. It's the rules that we set about the technology we use. It affects you, you know, especially if you end up on the wrong side of a prosecutor or something like that. It, it's not just laws. It, it's really important to, to recognize when people talk about policy, it can be just agreements people make. You know, the most the famous one I like to talk about is, you know, some one person cuts the cake, the other one chooses. What you're doing there is you're aligning incentives for the best outcome. You're making sure that someone, that the, the two sides sort of come to some meeting of minds and, and both people either walk away happier or, 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 or just a little bit sad. Um, but this can often prohibit certain things. So for example, you couldn't take satellite imagery that was a sub three meter or sub one meter resolution for a long time because of the US and Israeli national policy um, because they didn't want you imaging things that were that small. Um, but it, it does mean eventually we're gonna have to think about really serious things. So for example, at some point you'll be able to molecularly, molecularly print things like sarin gas, you know, things that are effectively weapons of mass destruction. Um, to what extent should you be prohibited from doing that? To what extent, you know, should, can, you, can, can you control that? Do we have to sort of come up with sort of a new collective social contract to make sure that if you're printing uh, effectively nerve agents in your, in your, it's probably not a good idea, uh, in, in, your, in your bedroom or your, your living room, um, it, it, you, know, you know, we gotta find a way to do this or we're gonna you know, destroy ourselves. Um, and then it even gets to the more esoteric, uh, the, the, the not so esoteric things. For example, there, there's someone in our community that I, re the community that I respect a lot who has, a, and I won't uh, mention their name, um, who has a tutorial online about how to buy a pager off of eBay, solder some leads in the right place, and you can actually eavesdrop on all the pager traffic around you. Now, just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing, and that is wiretapping. You're one disgruntled prosecutor away from, from having a really bad time. Um, anyway, so that's just a, a really great, basic introduction. Um, so now I want to talk about some, some of these uh, war stories. So the first one is the one that I led with, the SOPA and the DNS. Um, this was a set of bills in 2010 and in 2011, the first one introduced by Senator Leahy, that effectively, the, the whole premise was to keep people from sharing stuff that was copyrighted that mostly the big content players didn't want to see um, being shared. And it allowed you to, allowed the federal government to seize a domain, which means, you know, basically point that domain somewhere else and lock any ability to change where it points to. Um, at that time, the folks at CDT heard from the te technical community, they're like, this is, this is pretty crazy. You know, how do you just come in and, and you know, seize a domain name? Um, it's not gonna work. You know, you can still, even though if you block a domain name, you can still get access to the stuff, either by using an IP address, um, something that may be shared or whatever, you could use a proxy in another country that doesn't have that kind of jurisdiction. Um, it, but getting around those kind of blocks can actually pose pretty significant security risks. You may be in a place where, you know, that proxy may not, you know, have the same kind of security guarantees that something else may have. Um, there's also a pretty significant risk of collateral damage. You know, names have a lot of dependencies. You know, something that's .net may collide with something that's .com. And if you pull one out, they may not work anymore. 
Um, and it actually kind of looks like the threats that things like DNSSEC, whether or not you like DNSSEC or not, actually looks like the things that DNSSEC is trying to stop, right? So this, that, that looks like the government basically attacking the DNS. Um, that bill was killed in 2010 by Senator Wyden. Awesome. Um, he's such a good guy. Um, and then in May 2012, Senator Leahy uh, uh, put a, put a, basically redrafted it, it wasn't very different, called it the Protect IP Bill. CDT said, hey, we need to get the nerds here. And this was, th that clip was in December of 2011, so this is before that. Um, we basically said, let's get the best people we can find that know stuff about DNS. Um, and this is the, the, the six people right here. Um, some of you may know them. Um, I don't think any of them are in the room, but they might. Um, it's a big room. Um, anyway, and th this whole thing was basically re reiterating those technical concerns. And then, then Senator, Lo or, sorry, uh, Representative Lofgren from California actually said, hey, Sandia, what do you think about these concerns? And Sandia said, they're exactly on point. And that's where you get everyone sort of recognizing that the technical reality is not something that's a partisan thing. It's not something you can really spin. You know, that's, that's the way it is. Um, you can quibble with certain things, um, but in the end, that, that, that has to sort of uh, win the day because if you break the internet, you don't want that to be the legacy of, of, your, of your legislation. Um, backdoors, man, oh man. The FBI has wanted backdoors for so long. Uh, they've tried to argue that they need backdoors since the 90s. And then it was more about, you know, using strong crypto through everything we do is going to be really dangerous without a way to get access to that stuff. You know, people use telephones and we can get access to that, but they start using these novel um, encrypted ways of communicating. We can't get access to that stuff. Sound familiar? You may have heard some recent things like that. Um, they proposed a series of, of things, key escrow systems, key recovery systems, a variety of things. The government holds the keys, the, a private entity holds the keys. Um, and then people like Matt Blaze came in and said, hey, I can take your proposal here, the clipper chip, actually turn it into a, a really good, uh, not really good, but a, a decent encryption device with no, no, no key escrow involved at all. Um, but even despite that, they were tweaking and modifying these proposals, trying to find a way that would make it palatable. Um, uh, it's another thing we did. Uh, um, Alan Davidson, who now fronts the New America Open Technology Institute, got a bunch of people together and said, look, we really got to sort of put a nail in the coffin here and talk about, you know, what are the security implications of having, like, all the keys to every communication in a building somewhere, or even half, you know, a sharded chunk of the keys in one building and another building somewhere else. You know, what are the implications of that? And these guys emphasize that, one, this isn't going to work. People can roll, roll their own stuff, and there's nothing you can do about that. Two, people are going to be able to buy it from places, the rest of the world, where they don't have these, these, this kind of a law. Um, and, and then three, you know, retooling our entire communications infrastructure to do this kind of stuff is really expensive. You don't want to do that. You want to sort of build off of things that we have. Um, but the FBI still is still arguing that they want backdoors. They've changed the way they talk about it. In the, in the past years, they've talked about how they're going dark. And when you hear them talk about this, they say, we can wiretap phones. Uh, people used to communicate over phones. They're increasingly not communicating over phones. That means our ability to eavesdrop on those communications is, is being dramatically reduced. Ha ha. Meanwhile, the NSA is grabbing all your stuff. Um, they, they've been arguing that they've been going dark for a while. In fact, we actually argue they've been going bright in the sense that, yeah, you don't use the phone so much. You use many other ways of communicating. You know, we walk around with these things that emanate signals all the time. Um, and in fact, there's a lot more things you can do with that stuff, you know, lo lo you know location stuff sent over the wire. Um, and and with, all that, with all that stuff, there's a very lower level of protection. You know, your, your telephonic real-time communications are protected by the law pretty strongly. You know, your, where you're at, your location information, other kinds of metadata you, you, you emanate are not so much. Um, and in fact, these kinds of backdoor proposals actually make the key escrow not seem so bad, right? Key escrow is the kind of thing, as a technical person, as long as I know a little bit about the assurances I have from the escrow or whatever, I could probably design that in a way that's not going to suck too bad, um, but you still have these trust issues there. Um, last year, we decided, well, this, okay, we're going to have to do this again, and we got basically the best people we could think of are fine, and I'm really sorry if you're not on the list. Uh, it was a real pain in the ass to get all these people to agree 
on all this, right? For example, can you say the word backdoor? I really wanted to say the word intentional vulnerability, which is like a total oxymoron. You know, why would you ever intentionally make something vulnerable? And, and the cool thing about this is that, you know, here we said some, some similar things. This isn't going to work. This makes things very insecure. Um, not only that, but a lot of the things that you want to tap are going to be open source tools, are going to have open source components in them where you're going to be able to see backdoors, rip them out, build them yourself. You can still get them from another country um, and, and things like that. And part of the, the trick here is like, this is the kind of stuff that we'd really love to work with you all on at some point is, you know, you can tell from this list, there are some, there are some big names in here. Bruce Schneier, Phil Zimmerman, Edward Felton. There's some that that may have more cachet in this room than they'd ever have on Capitol Hill. You know, the Eric Rascolas of the world. Um, you know, some of these people you may not even know, Nev Mitter, who's the CEO for Griffin, I believe, um, and, and Hovav Shakam, you know, one of the best applied slash theoretical cryptographers that I know of. Uh, Micah Sher, a former student of, of Matt Blaze's, who's now a professor at Georgetown. Anyway, um, that was a month before Snowden, <laughs> which is really interesting because Snowden, you know, and all those revelations did, did, did more than, than we could do with this one report, but this still stands, and it's still a really cogent way of saying, hey, don't do this, man. Don't even think about doing this. Um, uh, ah, I forgot to talk about this. So in, in 2013, some of the proposals that they were putting forward for these back doors were, were interesting. They know that the one thing that we really hated about the key escrow was you're doing it to everyone every single communication device is going to be sort of mandated vulnerable. Um, so they, they got a little clever and they were saying, well, we'll do this targeted backdoor mandate. And what that means is they'll show up with a letter that basically says, hey, we're interested in your, in your, your communication system, your app or whatever. Within some amount, like 90 days, we want this thing to be wiretap ready. Um, and, and if you don't, you're going to face cre increasing fines. And some of the this stuff was just crazy. For example, the first proposal we heard of that came out in the New York Times was, if you don't make your thing wiretap ready, you get a fine that's $20,000 that doubles every day indefinitely. And <laughs> you, you don't even need to do the calculation, right? It, within about a couple weeks, you hit the market cap of a company like Apple, right? And, it's, and then two weeks later, we heard a different version, which was, oh, it's additive, and it's only 10 grand. And I was like, you know, that's at least not ri too ridiculous. But, you know, small, small companies, small startups will fold and will do this without, so they don't have to pay this sort of, whoa, daily tax uh, on, on their operations. Um, anyway, uh, so the last thing I'll talk about really quick, and then we'll move on to uh, the things that I think are coming, and I definitely want to want to leave plenty of time for questions, discussion, whatever you want to do. Um, last year, there was a couple of really important Supreme Court cases. Hopefully, some of you heard about them. Um, we were involved with this. The EFF was involved with these. ACLU was involved with these. The, the basically, the, the issue was, if you get arrested, if you get pulled over, whatever, and subject to arrest, you know, the cops can search your wallet, and they can search your, your body, they can do a bunch of things. Can they search your, your phone? Can they search the, a laptop inside your bag, which was not part of the case, but it's very similar kind of a situation. To what extent can they search stuff that, that is on your person that is digital? Um, you know, the Fourth Amendment requires you get a warrant before you do some of these really deep uh, uh, really invasive kinds of searches. And so just being arrested, you know, there's, it's very easy to get arrested. I've been arrested a couple times. Um, <laughs> it, it's unfortunate if you, you know, I mean, I don't recommend it, you know, try to avoid it if you can. Uh, um, but, you know, inevitably, like being a smart ass is a great way to get, to get arrested. Slapping a p cop horse's ass is a great way to, <laughs> to get arrested. Um, uh, that's actually uh, assaulting an officer, by the way. Uh, I did not know that. Uh, um, so, but, but there are some limited exceptions. When they, when they arrest you and they, 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 do, they can search some stuff, specifically if they think there's a, a danger to the officer. I mean, what, what's going to be dangerous in your phone? Maybe you have a script that makes your battery do something and it blows up. I don't know. Um, evidence destruction, so remote wiping and stuff like that. Uh, us and the EFF, along with the just brilliant help of the Yale Constitutional Law Clinic, submitted what's called an amicus brief. This is something where in a court case, you have the people duking it out, and we come in as an amicus, which is Latin for friend, friend of the court. You come in and you say, hey, these guys are fighting, but you may not actually realize there are bigger issues in, at stake here. There, there are other things you need to think about. And we talk quite a bit in this, uh, this brief about the technical stuff in the sense that just consider how much stuff you keep on your phone 
with you every day. You know, if you've had a phone for a very long time and you've successfully, you know, migrated from one phone to another phone to another phone, um, you may have years and years and years of years of stuff on your phone. It's a big deal. It's a big part of sort of your digital identity, your digital self. Um, you should not just, be, by getting arrested, have all that stuff subject to someone going through and trying to find ev any evidence of criminality, even if it's photoshopped, right? What are they going to know? Um, and the, the other thing that I thought was really important, and, and we didn't focus as much about on this as uh, another group, Epic, who are just awesome, did, which is if they're dinking around on your device, it's very hard for them to know what's on your device and what's in the cloud, right? And, and so they could be searching your device, but in fact, they're searching stuff that could be on your home. It could be something that's not really anywhere. It could be sharded across a whole bunch of places. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that, that we really need to think about. You know, you don't want to be pulling in arbitrary amounts of information at this, this, this very sort of uh, basic um, kind of search uh, uh, and arrest kind of a situation. Um, now, the Supreme Court luckily came down unanimously on the side of privacy there. It's one of a few cases recently where they've been really, really um, amazingly uh, pro-privacy, and it's really good to see that. There are a couple others that did that. But the government is still really worried about device encryption. To what extent can you encrypt your device and not give them access to stuff, even if they have a, something from a court that says they deserve access to that stuff. And they're also worried about remote wiping and sort of the, the, the fabled dead man switch, which I haven't ever actually seen one really work very well for a mobile device, um, you know, something where it has to send a signal out every so, so often or, or it wipes itself or receive a signal. Um, they're worried about those things. I, I, I don't see evidence for those being used by criminals, but, you know, whatever. Um, I'll skip that one. So focusing on some of the things that are coming up, encryption and encrypting the net is going to be a really big deal. Um, since w the Snowden revelations, you know, I think it, it, it's, it's just amazing what we've realized and how much protection you can get from encrypting things on the, on, you know, as they go over the net. Um, I think Ted Hardy at Google actually said it really good. He said, we've become addicted to clear text. You know, we do all these things to clear text in the middle of the network that sort of violates the end-to-end -end principle. Um, optimization on mobile networks to sort of, you know, reduce the, the size of, of images. Caching in general, inline caching. Um, protecting uh, ex exfiltration of data out, out of a network. The opposite, making sure bad stuff doesn't get in your network, malware detection. Um, ad injection, you know, taking HTTP requests and injecting ads like they do on some planes and stuff like that. There are some real fundamental tensions here. I don't know a way, and maybe someone else does, of doing caching in a way that sort of supports the end-to-end -end and doesn't leak stuff about what people are looking at. You just, it's, it, it, those two things are fundamentally irreconcilable. I think there may be some private information retrieval way of doing it, but I, 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 don't, I suspect not. Um, and, and the funny thing about, when I, when I talk to people about encryption, they're like, oh yeah, everything should be confidential. And I'm like, well, confidential is great, but at the same time, it's the integrity concerns, you know, especially injection. We saw the NSA just have a field day with real-time injection to get access and escalate into outside of browsers and stuff like that. And in fact, in December, uh, a pretty somewhat controversial RFC was published about what's called opportunistic security. And, and I really believe that it's a spectrum of secure. It's not secure or not. You know, it's not a binary thing. It's, it's sort of a spectrum. And this was sort of saying, look, you should, you should encrypt at all times and encrypt in an authenticated manner when you can. But don't think that authentication has to be something that keeps you from doing, sorry, a point-to-point -point encryption. Um, because you can still detect active man in the middle attacks and other kinds of things. And I think that makes a lot of sense, but I know there are people who just totally disagree with that, like most of the Chrome security team, I think, disagrees with that. Um, but then you get stuff like this, which is just so back ass words, it blows my mind. Um, companies like satellite companies, <laughs> thank you, Chris Segoyan, if you're in the room for um, having Yahoo encrypted by default, because when you encrypt Yahoo by default, apparently everyone you know, shits the bed, so to speak, and, and here, this is a, Viasat is a satellite uh, internet company that has this thing called Exceed, and their response, this is a slide directly from their presentation, is we're going to build a man-in-the-middle browser. It's basically a forked version of Chrome that, that does a whole bunch of stuff in sort of a trusted proxy, uh, don't worry about it, kind of a way, and they say, do we think this is superior to forging certificates and doing man in the middles is shipping them a whole browser. You know, I mean, it just blows my mind the 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 stupid that that is there. Um, but then again, you know, if you think about their point of view, they're like, 
Yahoo used to load three seconds over satellite. Now it takes 16 seconds because of all the round trips involved over SSL or TLS to, to load uh, Yahoo over a, an encrypted link. Um, yeah, okay. But I think you need to explain to your customers how setting stuff up into space, you know, <laughs> is a pretty serious uh, uh, way of getting internet access and there's going to be consequences to that. And, and, you, and, and Anyway, but it's funny. This, I, I just love this, this door hanger here that says this is a secure website. Exceed will be privy, exceeds the service, the browser, will be privy to any secure information you enter on the site. It says, no thank you, do not decrypt, which basically means, yes, I would rather be fully secure. Um, anyway, there's a whole bunch of things around hacking that aren't sort of the, the, the hacking concerns that, that a lot of you may have that you should know about. Um, if we can't have backdoors, and I really think it's, it makes a lot of sense not to have either blanket backdoor mandates or targeted backdoor mandates or anything like that, I want to know that my, my communication services are secure, I can run to, uh, to whatever point you can. You know, how is law enforcement actually going to accomplish access in the cases where they really need it, where everyone in this room would agree, damn, man, get that stuff, right? Um, they're going to need to do something like targeted exploitation. You know, and this is, gets to the, the uh, Bellavan, Blaze, Landau, and Clark kinds of ways of thinking, which is, you know, all our software has bugs. Use those bugs to get access to bad guys' stuff. Don't use, uh, you know, sort of backdoor man mandates to do that. But in order to, to do any of that, even if you accept that there are just one case a year where they need to do that, they're going to need, need to either buy zero days or they're going to need to develop zero days. And, and how should they do that? You know, I mean, this is something where I'd love to engage with all of you on this. You know, to, should they disclose as, as soon as possible to vendors? So that means that the government's going to be paying top dollar for these zero days and then disclosing them to vendors. Maybe that means that what you'll have is, on balance, things get fixed faster. That seems good. You're getting bad guys in these cases where there are, you know, really egregious things, but you end up getting things fixed faster. That sounds great. Um, it's really subtle though, right? And it changes and there's this whole level of economic analysis with the markets for zero days that frankly, I'm just not, you know, I, I, I don't know a whole lot about that. Um, there's this also this tendency to, to in, in DC lately, it's been like CrowdStrike is, is a big proponent of this and they've been talking about this quite a bit, which is, you know, hacking back. And, and in fact, uh, the former head of the NSA, General Hayden recently said, you know, hacking back should be like the digital equivalent of the stand your ground laws in, in places like Florida. And I'm like, this doesn't make any sense. Those don't even, like, those two metaphors don't work at all. Um, and, and there are sort of like these really interesting sort of academic frameworks that, that think about this. Like there's this AAA methodology that you may have seen, which is um, attribute, uh, oh wait, no, uh, annoy, attribute, attack, and sort of a spectrum of, of the invasiveness of things you do um, if you're going to be hacking back, whereas annoying is, is stuff you do in your network perimeter, you know, black holing, all sorts of tricky things you do there, making fake documents, stuff like that. That sort of gives no one pause unless you're infecting folks who show up. And even then, I don't know, you know, we, we can talk about that. Um, attribution and attacking is where you get, you know, attribution, you can do things with web bugs and other ways of making network connections out. Um, and attacking, you know, what does that even mean? The closest I've heard people sort of articulate it is a non-technical person, Stuart Baker, um, who talks about things like uh, people who are attacked should be able to go get their data back. And <laughs> I don't know what that means. I think what it means is you go and you intrude yourself into the, the network you suspected took your stuff, and then you, like, what, calculate all the signatures or checksums, and you find your stuff, and then you securely delete your stuff, and hopefully you don't take down that system. I, I don't know. I mean... Uh, who knows? And, and so that's like industry that wants to hack, but the, the government wants to hack too, right? Um, and in fact, they're trying to do something, and this is really obscure, right? I mean, this gets into the stuff that we work in every day, which is almost as, 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 as esoteric or, or as detailed as sort of like the BIOS hacking stuff that we were just uh, uh, learning about. You know, they want to rule something, they want to amend something called Rule 41 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure. So what the hell is that? Uh, the federal rules of criminal procedure basically say, here are the instances in which you can get a warrant to go seize evidence. Um, that's Rule 41. They want to do two things. They want to actually get the ability that if you are obfuscating your location using technical means, that's what it says, obfuscating your location using technical means, they should be able to get a warrant to 
break into your system and install what's called a SIPAV, a little piece of software that's a computer internet protocol address verifier that tries to learn as much as it can, as it can about your system and send it up to Quantico, presumably for the FBI. Um, that's basically, if you're using, you know, think about how many ways you could be obfuscating your location using technical means. They don't even say, is it geographic location? Is it network location? And even then, maybe I'm just nitpicking, but you know, any, anytime you use a VPN, you could be doing either of those things, right? Uh, there, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of ways that you can be doing that. Is that the thing that should trigger the ability to get a warrant to break into your system and install this stuff that, that roots around your, 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 your computer? Um, there's another piece about forum shopping of botnets, but I think I'm just going to skip that. Uh, unless you want to hear about it, but you can ask me later. Um, the Internet of Things is, is pretty freaking exciting, man. And you can't tell you how many uh, sort of the industry side, you know, you see oh, like freaking CES. I was in Las Vegas for a day earlier this, this month, and it was just like IoT, 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 Internet of Things is going to be everything, which is hilarious because at DEF CON, you know, the, the, I think the IoT in general like scares the shit out of the people in this room. I mean, these are little devices that are like, you take all these little pieces of hardware, all these little pieces of software, you put them together and you get this thing that may work for maybe like six months or something. Um, some of those companies are going to go out of business. Some of those things, some of those pieces of software or hardware are going to be shared across a lot of devices. And so if one of those is vulnerable, you're essentially weaving vulnerability throughout your entire environment if we don't do this right. Um, I'm really, really glad to see people like, like Josh and others doing I Am The Cavalry and build it securely and open garages, please. I mean, this is, you know, I, I kind of think of it as a collective civil cyber engineering corpse. And if you don't like the word cyber, just replace it in your head with computer and network and then you're set. You know, who, who gives a shit? It's shorter, fewer, fewer syllables. Um, but it, it's kind of like we almost need something like that, like a, like a volunteer fire department or something like that of the internet. Um, but you know, in general, I think this is even bigger. Like, and I'm starting to see this everywhere. It's it's bigger than creating sort of a framework for developers to do things securely, or a framework for for people to to work on technical projects in a way that doesn't expose the world to, to bad things. Um, you know, I'm seeing this more and more, and we really, you know, more and more people out there really desperately need sort of the intuitive. Uh, grasp on technology that, you, that you'd get in sort of in your physical environment by living your life every day. You know not to jump off something that's too high and things like that. Um, I don't know how to do that, but I think part of it is like the people in this room, you know, with each interaction with another human, like for example, you know, if someone is, is frustrated with something and like, you know, I know a lot of us do tech support for our families, um, <laughs> uncompensated except for love, right? But even then, <laughs> You know, I'm starting to like, there, there's got to be things we can do. For example, um, don't just do things for people. Sit behind them and, and say, hey, go do this, go do this. Don't even touch their computer. And by doing it, I've seen this with a couple people, they start to learn how to sort of, you know, tinker around and figure out and solve problems, God forbid, on their own, you know. But they need sort of the familiar, familiarity with this kind of stuff to do that. And, and, and we got to find ways to do that kind of a thing. Um, yeah, and I should say a couple more things here is just that the, it's, it's, it's so easy, you know, we spend so much of our time breaking stuff. We spend so much of our time um, tearing things down and, and sort of uh, going on to the next thing, right? And, and I really think we got to, you got to build things, man. We got to, and, and they don't have to be the same things you break. They can be social things. They can be, you know, normative things like, hey, don't do that, asshole. You know, they can be things like that. They don't have to be technical by any means. Um, so this is the thing that, this is the slide that I spent the most time thinking about this week because I didn't expect this to happen. But on Tuesday, President Obama and his administration came out with a set of, a set of amendments to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA, which is the, the one, yeah, right? Boo. Um, and, and for a while I was like, man, it can't be that bad. Why would they do all this stuff. I mean, it just doesn't make sense why anyone would do that. But I really think my bottom line here is believe what you heard. It, it's bad. It, it, it looks really bad. Um, th some of the, and I think folks like Kurt and Nate from EFF should be able to talk a little bit more about this. I don't know if that's exactly their specialty, um, but because but, I'm not a lawyer. Um, but anyway, um, things like, for example, if you knew Aaron, it, 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 it it's still pretty fucking raw, you know, and Aaron was an awesome guy, and to see 
him having 11 or 12 counts of the CFAA that additively added like, you know, five years on top of each other. And he was he looking at that, even if, you know, he could get through the trial and stuff like that. It was just, despite if you, if you think what he did was legal or illegal, it, it was just so disrep disproportionate in terms of, 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 of a sentence or a possibility of a sentence or anything like that. And they've just doubled it. So now you can face upwards of 10 years as a felony crime for, for violating the CFAA. Not only that, there's no more freaking misdemeanors. It's not as if the prosecutor can say, hey, you seem like you're otherwise pretty good. We'll just chalk this up. You know, they can't sort of, they don't have any leeway anymore. The, the basic violation is now a felony, a criminal felony, not a misdemeanor. Um, this is the thing that really sucks. Uh, there's this part of the CFAA that criminalizes sharing password lists for whatever reason. Um, um, and they've expanded that to go so far as to criminalizing inform sharing information that then aids an attack. So if you share something and then it goes on to later be used in an attack, you just committed a crime. And like, that is the most basic thing that people in this room do and that you need to do to protect systems. You need to do to, to learn about how systems work. You need to do to sort of triage your exposure if, if something happens, right? Um, that is just extremely troubling, and, and it's hard to know what the impetus behind that was. There's some really weird crap in this, in this stuff, too. So, for example, um, there's always been this term of service violation piece that has sort of pissed a lot of us off, which is by visiting a website, and uh, no one reads the terms of service, but by violating something they wrote in there, like you shouldn't be wearing a red shirt or something like that, then by doing that, you've technically, if a prosecutor wanted to, could, could come and, and call that a, a CFAA violation. They've changed that stuff. And now one of the clauses for unauthorized access is if you've done something exceeding your access on a government computer. And, and it's hard to tell what they mean by this. And I think what they mean by this is, and I think like people like Orrin Kerr and others like that have said, this is targeted at government employees who may have technically access to a bunch of, of sensitive systems, but have signed something else or a contract or been read into some other thing, whatever, that limits them sort of by a written, like, don't go here, or don't go there. And if you violate that, you could have a felony. But it's not cabined that well. So for example, you know, I was just thinking about this. Um, if you're using a internet access computer in a public library, that is a computer owned by the government, if they have a, a, a sign that says something like, you, you can only use this for 30 minutes. If you sit there for 31 minutes, does that mean you've just fucking committed a felony? I mean, a prosecutor's not gonna bring that case, but you know, if you think about things like Aaron, you know, one of Aaron Swartz's you know, really cool coups was sucking down court documents in a public library in bulk for you know a couple days, and I'm sure that violated some sort of you know be it a acceptable use policy, be it a, a whatever. Um, he could have just he he could have started his his travails with the law a lot earlier in that case. And I think that just doesn't make sense. The stuff that and this is where it gets really weird because a lot of us aren't familiar with this kind of stuff. Um, they've added CFA a CFA violation is what's called a RICO predicate, and so RICO is what's used to prosecute prosecute organized crime. The whole notion there is that you may have the Tony Sopranos or the Al Capones of the world that are telling people what to do but not doing the criminal things on their own. And what they say is, if that activity is part of an enterprise, you know, sort of hierarchical or network structure, a cell or whatever, where the, the, the enterprise is what's gaze, engaging in the criminal activity and you want to attribute individuals' criminal activity to the ringleader, then you could bring the ringleader by saying, hey, you're part of this bigger thing. Um, you know, and, and people like Josh have said, you know, I am not now or have I never been part of anonymous is something that you, you may end up having to be able to say it some day to sort of get yourself off of one of these things and how many people, you know, online sort of associate themselves with anonymous off and on, or that's just an example. Um, it's, the, the word enterprise is so undefined in the law that it, it's really kind of scary that like by driving someone to a, uh, you know, a, a, a coffee house where they commit a hacking act or whatever, a crime, um, were you part of an enterprise that helped them? You know, can you just not associate with people who do those kinds of things? Are we in this room going to become like an insular community where no one wants to associate with us because they may be brought up on organized crime? I, I don't know. Um, 
the cool thing is that, I mean, not cool, but the good thing is the likelihood of these things going anywhere is pretty slim in a fully Republican Congress. Um, but that, that's not gonna, that doesn't mean a whole lot. We're still gonna fight this stuff. Um, and my last sort of thing to say is, you know, if, you, if any of this has interested you, if any sort of the, 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 where the technical hits the law kind of the stuff is interested you, consider, you know, working in, in this space. You know, we, a lot of us are hiring technologists and I call myself in my heart of hearts a policy technologist, but no one else does that. So I, I have to call myself a chief technologist, whatever. Um, but, um, you know, and you can't help in your free time, you know, the stuff that, that like Josh and others are doing with the cavalry, you know, some of these grassroots efforts to, you know, build up tools to build up, you know, ways of thinking about how we work on technical things, you know, uh, responsible disclosures, you know, things like that. Um, we can always use your support, CDT, you know, EFF, ACLU, Access, OTI, EPIC, all these groups around here that really dig in deep into the policy stuff in DC so you don't have to or so that you can come in every once in a while and just get up and tell a congressman what's what, you know, we'd love to get your help. Um, but I really think it's more like, you know, with every interaction you have with somebody, and it sounds really, you know, kind of, kind of silly or kind of altruistic, you got to think about, okay, is there, a, you know, is there a way I can structure this that can teach them? You know, it's, 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 it, we're not, you know, on some level we are stewards of the technical stuff. We find the stuff, we fix the stuff, um, but on another level, it'd be really good to, to sort of formalize a way of interacting with people that, you know, it's just simple, like, think of all, think of yourself as an educator. You know, you may be, a, a, a hacker, you may be someone who, who works in security, but at the same time, it would be really good. Also, if, if, if we could spread that throughout all of society on some little level, I talk to people, I say, I'm gonna build a tiny technologist within you. And what I mean by that is, you may think, oh, computers aren't my thing. And that's obviously very few people in this room, if anyone, but, but, but little tiny little actions, I think we can slowly make sure that this is, this is part of your social fabric is, is thinking about, you know, think before you click, stuff like that, right? You know, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, good things you can do. And so that's just, you know, bring in the nerds and we're good at tearing things apart, but I think it's time to start build, not just technical things, but, you know, sort of a movement in the sense that, you know, we're here to do something different. We're here to actually help people. We're here to, to fix things, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. And if you want to um, not do that, or if you want to sort of tear down other people's efforts, please don't, you know, I mean, it, 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 we love constructive criticism, but at the same time, when it, when it comes to, um, you know, just tearing people apart, you know, that it, it, it's just not going to be helpful. Um, anyway, that's sort of a mysterious way. Any, thank you. That's me. Um, this was all HTML, even though it didn't work so well because of my computer. There's my uh, PGP key and uh, everything else. Now, I'm really happy to take questions. I may have to refer some questions to folks like Kurt or Nate from EFF if, if they're big legal questions, but I'm happy to, to answer anything you might have. Even if it's not about something we covered on here, because I know about a lot of crap that happens in DC. Sir. Do you have any comment or do you have any input on the questionable legal methods that the FBI may or may not have used to capture the drug by the robber? Cool. So the question was, do you have any input or some other uh, verb about the questionable methods that the FBI used to capture the dread pirate Roberts. Um, this is intimately related to stuff like Rule 41, you know, these, these investigatory methods that they're using to find things on remote. Like, if they had had this rule, I don't think they would have had to do the crazy stuff that they had to do to get him. And so, even though they're questionable methods, there are things they would love to be able to do in the, you know, comfort of the, you know, the, the law enforcement, you know, uh, couch or whatever, without ever having to do some of the stuff they did before. Um, and, and by questionable, do you mean uh, what part? I guess I should have asked you back. What part? Uh, the, the legal questionable, ah, so questionable. So this is, you know, this is fascinating. So I'm going to answer your question, not answer your question at the same time. So what he said was, uh, they haven't disclosed yet how they discovered uh, where Dread Pirate Roberts was, where his servers were. We've heard some rumblings about it being through a CAPTCHA, you know, an undisclosed CAPTCHA, but we've heard other people talk about how the network ar architecture was such that it shouldn't have done that. Everything should have gone through the hidden service. Um, 
This, so I, the, I guess I should say first, I don't know. The second thing I should say is that um, we're really worried about the, the level of disclosure in these filings that the government does. They, they will say stuff like, we used a computer network, computer network exploitation tool. It's like, what the hell does that mean? You know, you know, and part of it is they don't want to give away their uh, sources and methods. They want to be able to use that over and over again. I have some sympathy for that, but it makes it really hard for us to evaluate how damaging, the potential for damage that that kind of a thing could have. You know, if you misattribute who you think Dread Pirate Roberts is, you know, it's very different, obviously, in the, in the digital world and the physical world. You know, if you're a cop breaking down a door in the physical world, you can be pretty sure that by breaking down this door, the whole building's not going to collapse or that all the other buildings around it aren't going to collapse. So that thing you thought was like a single family home isn't like a command and control system for a nuclear power plant or a you know, steel factory in Germany or something like that, right? And so it's really crucial that we get information about how they're conducting these. You know, uh, we all know how they break into houses. They use battering rams, you know, they use flashbang grenades. We don't like that, you know, but at least it's not a mystery about how they do these things. And actually flashbang grenades can set things on fire, right? And so there's this ongoing conversation about that right now. Um, we don't know if they're doing the flashbang equivalent in, in, in these cases. We just have no idea. They're often sealed, they're often ex party, which means that only the government makes a filing to a judge and no one ever gets to see it. Sometimes they're unsealed, sometimes they're disclosed on accident to us, but um, we don't have a lot of information. So I should say, I would love to know more about that. Um, I don't know how to know more about that without leaks, without um, you know, basically some sort of precedent that says, we deserve to know how you're breaking into people's shit. Sir. Yeah, you talked about the president's proposal for a State of the Union address. How much do we have to worry about that actually becoming law? And what can we do to try to prevent it? So I don't, I was gonna say not, you don't have to worry very much. <laughs> But I don't want to like make everyone feel like, oh, great, well, we don't have to worry about that. What I mean by we don't have to worry very much is that um, when, a, when a Democratic president <laughs> puts some proposals forward and you have two houses of Congress that are controlled by the Republicans and they have other ideas of things they want to do, then it's very unlikely that it will see the light of day like this. But we're going to treat it as if it's real and we're going to actually make arguments that say, look, uh, this is too far, this is ridiculous, this is going to criminalize, you know, staying too long on a library computer and stuff like that. So, uh, you don't have to worry too much, but stay engaged, you know, read deep links on the EFF, read our blog, we're going to, we'll keep you updated. Um, there may be a point, if it gets to it, at which we're going to need to really sort of show the, the community to the world in a way that people can understand, you know, we're here to help, you know, I, I hate to sound so, so hippie about it, right? I mean, I left California exactly for that reason. But uh, <laughs> on some level, you know, it's, it's, it, it's, it's really important that we show that, that hackers aren't people who just break things, that hackers, part of breaking things, like part of doing that is, is, is undergirding the infrastructure of society. We're using all this crap for it, but we need to have a way of selling that to people and, and talking to people about that. And, and that's a real challenge. I don't have really good answers for that, but I'm thinking about it. Yes, ma'am. As an individual bit, what's the best thing that we can do to help move this in directions that we want? Is it writing our congressman or is it running our mail servers or is it something that we can do? Yeah, so as an individual bit, what can you do to help um, the most? It depends on what aspect of this uh, because, you know, fortunately, there's so many different things that are happening at once that, you know, you can influence them in a bunch of different ways. The first one is just uh, the fact that you're here, the fact that you're listening, the fact that you're aware of these things is really important. You know, you may talk to them, to people. You may even explain them to people who are non-technical and say, look, the reason that this thing got fixed was because someone found that problem, told the vendor about it, and, and we got together. You know, I like telling stories about Heartbleed <laughs> just because I think, and that's why I have this sticker right here somewhere, you know, that was such an amazingly, wow, I mean, the bug of bugs, right? And then shell shock and these other ones are just these huge bugs. And, and there's ways to talk about that with people I think that help. Um, I definitely think things like running Tor exit nodes, if you can do that, uh, it's very difficult to do that in a way where you won't get lawyer letters or MPAA letters. If, if you're a Princeton student, by the way, you can run a Tor exit node on Princeton campus, thanks to Tom Lowenthal, come talk to me and I'll show you the exit policy you can use. It's pretty cool. They're very high bandwidth nodes. Um, you can also give money to places like Tor servers, which, which their whole reason they exist is to run high bandwidth Tor nodes. Um, uh, they're, they're, I'm, I may not be the best person to, to, to talk specifically about how you can influence it, but 
come talk to me and, and we'll figure it out. And there's plenty of other people around here like Josh and others that can uh, and talk about uh, you know, other ways that you can contribute for sure. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was, um, how aware is the general public of, of these issues and what can we do to sort of raise awareness in, in the, the mainstream public for these issues? Um, that is a really good question, man. Um, on some level, you know, it, it's almost like we need a really high paid marketing group to sort of spin, you know, uh, our image or I don't know, I don't know what it is, but, you know, I really think that by, by showing that hackers positively contribute to society. You know, like that, you cannot fucking argue with that. But that's not what the general public thinks. The general public sees data breaches. And, and you know, the crazy thing about these Obama laws is there are only people who are on U.S. soil, right? I mean, like what percentage of, of, of crackers doing crazy stuff are not on U.S. soil? A lot, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty big. So, um, man, I feel like I'm just not, not giving you what you want here uh, in terms of advice, but I think that on some level it's, it's thinking hard about, you know, try to talk to people maybe. You try to talk to people that you consider the mainstream public, you know, inter interact with them and say, you know, or if you hear someone say, uh, oh, those hackers or blah, 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 or whatever, something negative, instead of like going pshaw, walking away or, or yelling at them or whatever, you know, say, well, why do you think that, you know? Uh, and if they know you, say, hey, you know, you, you know, I'm a hacker, you know, I do things that, that are fundamentally about, you know, making sure that we know what we don't know and that we, we, we realize the, 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 um, the holes in the system and that we can plug them because, you know, awareness is half the battle. I think it's a very unsatisfying answer. I'll think about it and you know, send me an email and I'll, I'll, I'll maybe have a better answer for you. Sorry. No, I just wanted to thank you. Okay. So thanks to Joe for the... <laughs> Woo! <laughs> so um, every year as a thanks to our keynote speaker, we give you a severed moose head. Um, it has become tradition, and we would hope that you would hang it on your wall. Uh, this is in many an esteemed office, so there's a limited number. And um, uh, congratulations. Well, <laughs> anyone can go buy themselves one, but you know, you, this is a true moose head from Shmukon. So thanks, for, thanks, thanks very much, Joe. Appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm a, I didn't know that I was going to be the keynote, so I have to do things like hang blinds and crap like that that my wife is making me do. No, but I'm going to try and be here for some of the weekend, like uh, I think a bit on Sunday. Um, but if, if, if you're local or if you're not, I'm all over the world these days. Uh, just let me know. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs>